want to thank you guys for watching Show Me The Sequel and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now. Like this video and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Today, we'll be concentrating on the ultimate battle. The ultimate slasher versus. The film known to fans and detractors as Freddy vs. Jason. A film where the Elm Street slasher meets the Crystal Lake killer and they see who has the chops to kill the other and reclaim their place in the nightmares of teenagers across the world. The film opens with Jason's musical theme and quickly gets to Freddy in a boiler room, telling the viewer his story while making a glove with flashbacks to his early kills. He's been forgotten, but has found a way to bring back fear when he found Jason in hell. Cut to a girl skinny dipping in a lake, perfect for a Jason kill. As his mother talks to him, we see some of his kills. Freddy has found his way to Jason, using his mother to get him working. The house, a new family. A teen girl and friends hanging out. Jason is stalking nearby as the boys show up. Perfect slasher victims. The talk turns to the old boyfriend who seems to be missing. Couple going upstairs to have sex, which leads to a kill, obviously. Teens get scared, bump into cop who brings up Freddy, everyone to the station, hush the Freddy talk. But our lead Lori somehow remembers him and ends up dreaming of him while she waits. Switch over to one of the boys. He has a fight with his father for being out. Freddy tries to kill him, but he's not strong enough yet. So Jason will have to do. Now at West Hills, the familiar hospital. The news shows the house, the missing boyfriend, Lori's love is right there and panics. He needs to know if she's okay. There's some fighting, some talk of the dream demon. Something is underway. Boyfriend Will and his friend Mark break out. Next thing we know, Lori and her dad are fighting. She goes to school. This is a great excuse to introduce more kill fodder, er, teenagers. Here, we meet a well-intended nerd, Charlie. See more of Kia and Gib, enters discussions of a party and the arrival of Will, which puts Lori over the edge and in the nurse's office. From there, the film develops in a lot of ways one would expect from an Elm Street film. The party happens, Jason kills, Freddy makes an appearance. Lori and her dad have a fight, lots of truth bombs. Mark becomes the clear crazy Ralph of this film. He knows a lot. We get all the kids in one place, Cool cop shows up with background on Jason. Things take a turn. Of course, it's Freddy. They all head back to West Hills. More exposition and hypnosol. A cool Freddy as a worm sequence. Jason shows up. Cool cop gets electrocuted. They all look for hypnosil to save themselves. Jason finds them instead. Stoner boy possessed by Freddy drugs up Jason and dreams of the boiler room. The two have their first epic fight with a lot of bouncing. Freddy seems to win this round. Back to the kids. They plan to bring Jason back to the lake. They have him drugged, but things are getting hairy. Lori goes in his dreams to pull Jason out. They crash the van. Everyone ends up in a cabin which catches fire. A good Freddy versus Jason fight. It's destructive. Lori and Will run. Kia meets with Freddy with some less than okay to today's standards language. Jason offs her. Freddy is now pissed. That was his kill. So he stabs Jason a few times. Lori wants to fight Freddy. Freddy and Jason have another fight in a construction site. It gets comedic and a touch silly. Massive fire again. More fighting. Freddy loses an arm but seems to win. Jason stabs him with his own arm. Lori beheads Freddy. Jason gets seemingly killed in the lake. Lori and Will leave alive. Freddy and Jason came into this with more kills than most other slashers out there and reputations for being pretty brutal in their own ways. Freddy had seven films before this and Jason had 10. Bringing them together is something fans had been wanting and something the studio knew would make money. Of course, rights and the right script were the main issues here. So with the tease at the end of Jason Goes to Hell, it was a no-brainer to make this happen. Both franchises had made a bunch of money on their own, Freddy having made close to $260 million at the box office, and Jason having made $226 million. 
This was bound to be a hit. Well, it was a pretty massive hit, making 116 million, beating each entry in both franchises quite a lot. Clearly, this was a great move. To get to this result, the producer had to make choices between 17 scripts, many of which were more about a cult trying to use the iconic killers than about them. So, after much back and forth and many failed starts, they finally settled on the one scene in the film. Was it the best script? For them it was. Does it have a few issues? Absolutely. The script, however, that came the closest to the origins of both Freddy and Jason, even though it makes Jason afraid of water, which is known to be incorrect. Directed by Ronnie Yu from a script by Damien Shannon and Mark Swift, the film of course uses characters created by Wes Craven and Victor Miller. Yu is a director more known for his martial arts film, including Wushu and a lot more realistic fighting films, including Brandon Lee's very first film, Legacy of Rage, and films like Fearless and Warriors of Virtue. His previous foray into American cinema was Bride of Chucky, another horror comedy based on a beloved character. His work here is decent, but not his best. He has also spoken about this film not being his favorite to have worked on. For both Shannon and Swift, this was their first feature as writers, and they followed it up with the Friday the 13th remake and the Baywatch film. Their work is interesting here, but the fact that they retcon some of the background for Jason, making him afraid of water, is a pretty big fail on their part. Yes, it serves the movie, but it also greatly annoys fans of Jason. This film here relies on a lot of special effects, and not all of them were created equal. That opening sequence in its CGI dated and a bit painful these days. The practical effects, including Kruger's face, fantastic work. There is a lot of everything here from bloody kills to fire stunts and everything in between. While most of it is great, it's not all great. Thankfully, some of the sequences are fantastic. The bathtub sequence with Zack Ward is fantastic, and so is the fun stoner versus Worm Freddy. There are, of course, a few other bits that don't work, but overall, the effects by WCT Productions are great. More practical effects, better kills in these cases. Besides the effects, something many will remember are the sex scenes, which is something that led to issues as you attempted to push Catherine Isabel to do nudity when it was in her contract that she would not. Eventually, a body double was used, and fans were none the wiser. As a film that comes from one franchise that had TNA all over the place, it was expected here. Could it have been handled better? Absolutely. In the end, the body double worked great, and the consequent kill is right in line with Jason. Freddy vs. Jason is a fun film that mixed two very different slasher icons in the mute Jason and the catchphrase spilling Freddy, and manages to make a fun film out of the two meeting. Granted, throughout the movie, it does feel like it's perhaps more Freddy's film than Jason's, but this may have more to do with the number of lines each have and how they interact with the teens than with a bias from those behind the camera. Of course, the film gets silly at times, that pinball machine sequence, like really, but once the brain is mostly turned off, it's a fun ride from Elm Street to Crystal Lake, and it does bring a few new ideas to the table and incorporates what people love about each icon. Of course, having Robert Englund reprise his role as Freddy was a must and respected. Switching up from Kane Hodder to Ken Kersinger for Jason was something fans were not about. However, once the film came out, most came around and just enjoyed the movie. It's a fun film with lots of practical effects, some good kills, and a few good fights between the two villains. What's not to love? The sequel here picks up a bit later. Freddy has had time to figure out that how to keep controlling Jason was his head on a table, like he used to have his mom's. Freddy has entered his mind and is slowly controlling him again, regaining power. As Jason gets to kill more and more nearby the lake, eventually a group of fishermen bring up Freddy's body and put him on the beach. Soon after, his body disappears. Cut to some teens, coming to the lake for spring break. Freddy sees his opportunity and kills a couple before they can have sex, thus frustrating Jason. As they each work on offing this group of teens, one of them is texting descriptions and drawings to a friend at a nearby college. The myths of Freddy and Jason are reborn. As her friend never comes back from the lake, the recipient of the messages puts it all online, thus creating more and more potential victims for Freddy to haunt through dreams. At the same time, some go to investigate at the lake, 
giving Jason some victim fodder. Now is the time to bring in our extra icon. One people won't see coming. One in his mid-fifties, a bit bumbling, a bit making it up as he goes along. He has issues, but he knows the supernatural. Could he be Ash Williams? Nope. Someone who has the means to find these killers? Could it be Harry Damore? Nope. A cool car? Some weird training? Ray Stance? Nope. As he sits at home a few states away, a man in his mid-fifties is seen watching his computer screen where videos of the new supposed creepypasta are showing. As we close in on him, a photo on the wall is shown, that of a known vampire and monster killer. Then the face of the man watching is lit up a bit by his phone ringing. It's Charlie Brewster, clearly older, clearly still believing what he was watching in videos. He checks his messages, grabs his supernatural being fighting gear, his cross, and heads out onto the road in his cool, beat up muscle car. As he finds his way towards Crystal Lake, we see maps, the old school kind, with marks and can see that he's been keeping an eye on a few killers. Clearly marked are Crystal Lake, Haddonfield, Springwood, New York City, Chicago, etc. He has newspapers in the back from Burkittsville, Los Angeles, Santa Carla, Winter River, and a few others, as well as books and DVDs on multiple different creatures and killers. He's clearly been busy and learning about all kinds of supernatural beings and killers. He's been busy. He looks the part. As he stops to set up at a motel near Crystal Lake, we get a glimpse in his trunk. All kinds of weapons, spell books, clothes, etc. are all over the place. He's ready for this. Meanwhile, Freddy is gaining strength and killing more and more. A girl accidentally pulls him from her dreams, making both his body on the beach and his head in Jason's cabin vanish. He's back in full form. He haunts, hunts, and kills as many as he can, but still takes the time to instill fear in each victim. Through each victim, more information is put online with reports and friends spilling what they have heard. The internet makes Freddy stronger as the fear becomes bigger and bigger. Jason is still killing, finding more and more teens coming to visit the location of the kills he's done before. Of the story of Lori and Will, Jason can hardly keep him, but that's not going to stop him from trying. He kills and kills, murdering kids behaving badly around his cabin. Near the lake, the kill count is high here. As Freddy is coming closer and closer to Jason, Brewster is following their kills, making them on a map, learning their patterns, something seems to be pulling them to each other. As he prepares to go meet them and attempt to dispatch them, he learns as much as he can from as many sources as he can. He also reviews Peter Vincent's journals. Once he believes the two killers are about to meet, he grabs his gear, some choice weapons and books, and heads out. Once at the lake, Freddy is clearly there. The fear is palpable, and Jason lurks. Teens are camping all over the place around the lake, telling each other stories of each killer. Brewster tries to talk them into leaving, but ends up sounding crazy. Suddenly, Freddy and Jason are face to face. Freddy tormenting Jason, Jason ready to fight. An epic battle ensues. As they both weaken each other, Brewster prepares. He reads out loud from a book. After a few shots of his using his cross to no effect, he uses a shotgun to keep Jason at bay and sends him back to Freddy. The fight rages on. Blood everywhere, limbs flying. Jason's mask comes off. Freddy loses his hat. Everything goes. Suddenly, Brewster finds the right passage. He reads it out loud. A gate opens in the ground and swallows both Jason and Freddy, with Freddy looking actually scared. They both disappear into the hole and their theme music mingle and fade into silence. The camera pans and Brewster is back in his car, looking at his phone. A message from New Mexico is asking for help. So this is it. Would it be a good idea to bring in someone like Charlie Brewster to the fold? Could he defeat them both? Could he even keep them at bay? 